th thanks, Randy. I really appreciate you having me to this conference, which has been super interesting, and I've, I've enjoyed all the discussions so far. Uh, and it's also good uh, to see Andy Goodhart again. Uh, we worked at the Pentagon at the same time together, or at least I was there for a brief period of time when, when he was there, actually working in, he was working in the office uh, whose product I'm criticizing in this paper. And so this, this ought to be uh, good fun. And I'll just note at, at the outset that the paper is uh, a co-authored piece that I did with a good friend of mine, Evan Montgomery. And so if, if you like it, please direct praise at me. And if you don't like it, I'll give you Evan's home address. Uh, so uh, I'm actually going to pick up in sort of a, a similar place, I think, where Bill left off. And so just to kind of give away the, uh, the, the, to give away the ending of the paper, uh, the, the paper is written essentially as an argument for a very engaged American grand strategy that costs a ton of money. But where we end up is we also say that the other logical position to take in this debate is kind of the restraint position. It, it's, it's basically to be candid about the risks that the United States is running with this mismatch between its defense strategy and it's grand strategy. And just as Bill argued that offshore balancing gets you kind of in, in the worst of all worlds, what we argue is that the worst of all worlds is to essentially try to muddle through with a strategy that gives you one theater worth of capability in, in a three theater world. And that's the riskiest of, of all approaches. And so obviously the paper is about the intersection of defense strategy and, and grand strategy with respect to the national, the national defense strategy in particular. And where, where we start is we argue that it's, it's probably not too strong to say that that document represents at least a, a mini revolution in U.S. defense strategy over the past 30 years. So the United States military is no longer going to be focusing on uh, dealing with rogue states or terrorist groups or other deadly, albeit relatively weak enemies. Instead, DOD and the rest of the country is going to be training its sites on China and Russia. These are the great power rivals that are contesting American advantages and uh, threatening to reorder the world to, to a certain extent. And the main pillar of this strategy is a new approach to, to force planning, which basically outlines uh, how the U.S. military should be built to fight. For a long time, for more than a generation, the U.S. had what was essentially a two-war standard uh, to make sure that we could defeat a pair of regional adversaries simultaneously or very close to simultaneously. Now DOD has embraced a, a one more standard that's geared toward defeating a great power rival. So we're no, we're no longer looking to win multiple medium-sized wars. We're looking to win a single very big war against a very challenging competitor. And this is the most important shift in U.S. defense strategy since the end of the Cold War. And it's got a lot of ramifications for a country that uh, still has security commitments and security challenges around the globe. And the argument we make here is that the one war strategy, the one war standard, and we're gonna, we use those short terms interchangeably, even though they mean something a little bit different, isn't crazy. It actually reflect, reflects some very serious strategic thinking. It's rooted in real budgetary and bureaucratic constraints. It's a recognition that defeating a great power adversary would be much more difficult than anything the US military has had to do in decades, and that losing a great power war would be basically the worst thing that could happen to America's global interests. And yet, the strategy is, is far riskier. It, it, it carries with it far more danger than I think its advocates publicly acknowledge. And those dangers, particularly the creation of a, a big mismatch between grand strategy and defense strategy, is really what I'm going to talk about here. And so just, just for starters, let me say a little bit about defense strategy and defense planning in general. And so for those who don't you know, live, uh, eat and breathe this stuff, uh, at the core of every US defense review is something that's called the force planning construct. And this is the thing that specifies uh, how many, what type and what frequency of conflicts the US military should be prepared uh, to face. It's probably the most important aspect of a defense review because it tells you what the US military should be able to do and how big and capable it has to be to achieve the nation's objectives. And, and as I mentioned, the key innovation of the 2018 NDS is this one war, great power centric force planning uh, construct. Uh, Jim Mitri, who was one of the officials who was deeply involved in this, has really outlined the logic of the one war strategy in, in great detail in an article he wrote in the Washington Quarterly. And so I would, I would commend that to people who want to get into the details on this. But, but basically, the idea is that the US military should be sized and shaped to beat China or Russia in a high intensity war close to their borders 
not to defeat some combination of Iran and North Korea and terrorist groups and, and things like that. It's not that we're ignoring all these other things. We're just not structuring the military around being able to defeat them uh, anymore. And so uh, for, for most of the post-Cold War era, we had this two MRC, two major regional contingency construct, just to make sure that a bad actor in one theater couldn't exploit our preoccupation when we were wrapped up with another. So North Korea couldn't get the jump on us while we were dealing with Saddam Hussein, for instance. And that was thought and was expressed to be critical to the credibility of a grand strategy that was based on upholding stability in multiple theaters uh, around the world. So it's a big shift. Why are we making this shift? I, I think three factors are most important. And, and the first set of factors are essentially strategic considerations. Basically, just the world has changed. In the 1990s or 2000s, uh, America's main opponents were non-state actors or, or rogue states. Now they are big, powerful state actors, near-peer competitors in, in Pentagon parlance uh, that pose an increasingly severe threat to U.S. military primacy in key regions, if not yet uh, globally. And I won't go through all the detail on this, but basically Russia and China have both managed to combine uh, pretty significant military modernization programs with the geographical advantages they would have operating close to their own uh, frontiers. And, and so winning a war against them over Taiwan or over Estonia or, or some other uh, frontline country would require the US basically to project military power into the jaws of Chinese and Russian A2AD capabilities in order to defend our most far-flung allies and, and partners. This is a more severe challenge than anything that DOD has faced in a very long time, I think it'll require uh, fundamentally rethinking how US forces project power into contested environments, how they operate without the secure rear areas to which we become accustomed, uh, how they prevent a numerically superior adversary from creating a fait accompli, from overrunning key territory before the United States can get there uh, to help. So it's, it's definitely going to require a different type of force than the one that basically chased bad guys around the greater Middle East for a couple of decades. And because the consequences of, of losing a conflict against China and Russia, I think, I think would be quite damaging for American alliances and America's global position more broadly, uh, we've got to make sure that we can win these fights if, if these commitments are things that the United States are going to uh, continue to have. So that's one set of considerations. The second is just resource considerations. Uh, the fact that the US faced relatively weak rivals during the post Cold War era made it plausible, at least in theory, although it was never entirely clear how it would play out in practice, for DOD to, to deal with more than one threat at a time. But, but today, it's pretty clear that conflict with either Russia or China would consume the vast majority of uh, US global combat, combat power. As one uh, Pentagon official uh, put it a couple of years ago, it, it would chew up the force. And so it, it's just beyond the Pentagon's ability at this point to defeat two major power rivals simultaneously or nearly simultaneously with the resources at hand. It's, it's, a not, it's not possible to defeat a major power rival and a regional power rival with the resources at hand. And so anything beyond a one war standard kind of seems to defy the laws of budgetary physics, at least at the moment. And then there are the bureaucratic uh, considerations. So for, for the idea that great power competition is returning is not new, it was at the heart of the previous uh, US defense strategy, the one that was issued in 2012 uh, as well. And yet for years, bureaucratic inertia has kept DOD from adapting as rapidly as it should. And, and so basically the one war construct, if you talk to people within the Pentagon, they will tell you that it is meant to be a bureaucratic blunt instrument. It is an unmistakable signal to actors within the Pentagon, particularly the services, that the department has to fundamentally change what it buys, how it trains, where it focuses its attention and resources. And, and so the shift to the one more standard, it wasn't undertaken lightly. It, it's based on some very plausible and powerful considerations. The challenge is that it also carries with it a lot of, a lot of risk. So, so what are those risks? I, you know, the most obvious one is that the U.S. could confront two or more conflicts at the same time. This isn't all that far-fetched given that the United States uh, currently faces at least five potential opponents. So China, Russia, uh, North Korea, Iran, and then the menagerie of terrorist organizations across three set three plus separate theaters. And then there's always the possibility of the unexpected crisis uh, or event, uh, let's say a civil war in Venezuela that might be deemed sufficient to require the involvement of American forces. And so you could have a two war scenario that would 
occur organically, right? With two crises escalating to conflicts more or less independently. This is what happened to the US in 1965, for instance, when we escalated in Vietnam at the same time that there was a crisis in the Dominican Republic and the United States sent in the Marines there, uh, army troops rather. Uh, or uh, the fact that we have a one war standard could actually make a two war scenario more likely. And so if US troops are involved in a major contingency but the US lacks sufficient reserves to deal with other rivals, then revisionist actors could plausibly see a window of opportunity to alter the status quo in their favor. And then in either case, the United States would face some pretty tough choices. Would we sort of send whatever forces were available to a second theater, even if they were overmatched? Or would we just allow the challenge to go uh, unanswered? And so this is not something that the, uh, the architects of the NDS missed, they, they thought about this. And then they offered, I think, uh, three solutions to this problem, uh, all of which have some, some real challenges. So the first argument uh, is basically that the United States can uh, avoid the second war by dominating the first war. And so if we are winning the first war decisively, if we're winning quickly enough to avoid being tied down for too long, then that will discourage uh, other challengers from starting another conflict. And so for example, let's say China attacks Taiwan and the United States intervenes and quickly achieves a decisive victory, then leaders in Russia or Iran or North Korea or elsewhere will be chastened in the way that many American adversaries or potential competitors or adversaries were chastened by the US victory in, in Desert Storm in 1991. And, and since uh, the ability to deter the second contingency turns on the outcome of the first, then there's a clear rationale for focusing pretty relentlessly on acquiring the capabilities and the competencies that are necessary to win that, that first war. So I think this argument, the demonstration argument is, is plausible, but it's also problematic. And so uh, for one thing, uh, the, the demonstrated ability to thwart one type of aggression doesn't necessarily translate into effective deterrence against others. And so stopping a Chinese conventional assault on Taiwan doesn't necessarily prove that DOD could defeat a Russian paramilitary incursion into a chunk of uh, Eastern Europe or something like that. Uh, just as important, there, there's no guarantee that the first uh, scenario would actually be easy. In fact, there's, there's considerable reason to believe that it would not if it involved Taiwan or the Baltic, for instance. And so even if the US won that first war, a victory against a very capable state rival would almost certainly take a heavy toll. We'd lose a lot of skilled personnel. We'd lose highly complex and expensive platforms that take time to replace, which would surely hamper our ability to take on another adversary in, in short order. And so that's why the first argument is a bit problematic. A second argument uh, holds that the US doesn't need to deter a second war because it can simply delay its military response and fight that second conflict after it has won the first. And so after the United States has thrown back Russia's bid uh, to dominate the Baltic states, for instance, it could turn its attention to Iranian aggression in the Persian Gulf or the latest North Korean uh, provocation or whatever it is, the Chinese challenge in the South China Sea, with the understanding that it would have to roll back some gains that the second adversary made while the United States was otherwise occupied. I, I think this argument makes uh, some sense. I think it works better in some scenarios than in others. I think the, the ability to fight conflict sequentially might keep opportunistic aggressors in check because they know that they'll get a sharp US response eventually. But again, there are some, some challenges. And so uh, for one thing, if you opt for delay, it risks allowing an opportunistic aggressor to successfully alter the status quo in ways that could be difficult to reverse. And in fact, this is the core argument of the national defense strategy. The whole thrust of the strategy is that the United States would find it too difficult to roll back Russian gains in the Baltic or Chinese gains in the Western Pacific after the fact. And so it has to be willing to deny those gains uh, in, in the first place. Uh, and that leads to, to a second problem, which is that the delay argument only makes sense when the first war is also the most important war. When it's a conflict against China or Russia, not a conflict against Iran or North Korea, or some other lesser threat. And so if the United States was fighting China and Iran tried to take advantage of the situation, it, it's an obvious choice. We would simply say, yes, we'll deal with Beijing now. And then if we have to, we'll turn our attention to Tehran later. But I think that that calculus wouldn't be so easy if the situation was reversed. So let's say that the United States was fighting 
a regional power like Iran or North Korea when a great power like China decided to initiate a crisis. In that case, the second war would be far more strategically consequential than the first. And so delay wouldn't be a particularly good option. The cost of that would be a lot higher. The, sec the second war might be a war that we simply can't afford to ignore in, in that scenario. There's also a third argument. And the third argument holds that the US can basically avoid this dangerous situation where we're, we're fighting a regional power and then a great power challenges us by exercising strategic discipline, by basically refusing to fight regional wars in the first place, that we should simply sort of swear off the idea of fighting a major conflict against an Iran or a North Korea. I, I don't think the United States should aggressively seek out a conflict against Iran or North Korea. I, I sympathize with the argument in that respect. And I think there are lots of reasons to be cautious about committing uh, US forces against second tier opponents. Prioritization is clearly important. But, but even if you leave aside just the empirical fact that the United States has never been good about predicting exactly which wars we'll fight and which we won't, as Bill mentioned, I think the problem is that swearing off wars against certain opponents comes kind of close to abandoning deterrence altogether. If we signal that we're not going to use force against second tier opponents uh, short of some truly extreme provocation, that risks signaling that America uh, can't or won't respond forcefully to aggression short of the outrageous. And I think that that's a recipe for, for destabilization in a number of these areas. So if none of these approaches adequately reduce the danger that the United States is gonna find itself confronting simultaneous conflicts, then the question arises, what, what do you do to uh, reduce the damage that you might suffer when this happens? Uh, you're gonna need other methods of deterring or if necessary, fighting multiple wars at once. Uh, and if you read uh, the public version of the NDS, it kind of hints that the United States can deter multiple rivals within the framework of a one war standard, but it doesn't provide much detail on how. I, I think there are three obvious options for how this might work, just based on our reading of congressional testimony uh, and other public statements of, of the logic behind the strategy. And so the first option would basically be outsourcing deterrence and war fighting by relying on your allies, or your partners to preserve the status quo in, in their home regions. And so uh, at, just as the Nixon administration tried to, to do this with say the twin pillar policy in the Middle East or the Nixon doctrine within uh, Asia, uh, we would again uh, give primary responsibility for holding the line say to our Middle Eastern partners or our European allies. I, I think it's true that U.S. allies and partners in theaters around the world, particularly um, in the Persian Gulf and Western Europe, could certainly enhance their military power in ways that would make them more resilient to coercion and, and aggression. I, I think it's kind of, it's a worthy goal, but it's just not going to work in, in East Asia. But, but I'm not sure actually that the allies in any of these regions can take on local threats uh, entirely on, on their own. And in fact, the reason the United States hasn't been able to extricate itself from commitments in these theaters, even though it has repeatedly tried over the past 70 years, is precisely because those allies and partners haven't been able to summon either the capability or, just as important, the collective will to confront the threats that they face without the promise of American military uh, support. And even if the US could theoretically get its allies, let's say in Europe or the Persian Gulf, to develop the improved capabilities uh, that they would need to confront threats on their own, doing so would actually risk forfeiting another big benefit of US security commitments and force deployments, which is the fact that they tend to suppress conflict between American allies and, and partners, which has contributed a lot to the relative stability of the post-World War II era. So that's one option. A second option is escalation. Uh, and so basically placing greater reliance on US nuclear forces to uh, deter to fight an opportunistic uh, aggressor. Uh, on its face, this would seem kind of a logical way to compensate for the, U the limits of U.S. conventional military strength. And so the threat would basically be if you invade Taiwan while we're tied up elsewhere, we reserve the right to use nuclear weapons, either in a battlefield context or far less likely in a strategic context. And in fact, the United States has always reserved the right to use nuclear weapons first during a conflict to defend its allies. That was clearly central to American strategy during the Cold War. I don't think it's particularly feasible, at least right now, uh, however. You, you can threaten, you can best threaten to go nuclear 
when you have massive nuclear advantages over your potential enemies. The United States could do this during the 1950s, for instance, but even in the early 1960s, American policymakers realized that the threat of nuclear escalation was kind of a bluff because if the other side had the ability to hit the US homeland with even a couple of nuclear weapons, the costs would be exorbitant for the United States. And the problem is that the United States just doesn't have anywhere near the damage, the damage limitation capability uh, it would need for this to be a credible option today vis-a-vis -vis Russia or, or China for that matter. Uh, and, and in fact, I think this option just isn't credible in a lot of ways. It was one thing to threaten nuclear escalation to prevent the Soviets from overrunning Western Europe, which would have shifted the balance of power in a catastrophic way for the United States. It's really another to threaten uh, to use nuclear weapons, even in a limited context, to prevent the conquest of tiny countries in the Baltic or uh, an admirable but relatively small democracy in, in Taiwan. Maybe you could devise some clever limited nuclear op options that might be useful kind of as a war stopping device, as a way of warning the other side that things are getting out of hand. But I think even that requires taking risks that uh, most Americans would find outlandish compared to the geographical, uh, the geopolitical stakes at hand. So that leaves you with a third option, uh, which is mobilizing. And so one of the explanations you'll sometimes get for the logic of the NDS is that uh, if we face two wars simultaneously, and in particular, if we're to face the nightmare scenario of simultaneous conflicts against China and Russia, we would just undertake a World War II style mobilization. We would dramatically expand the military. We'd provide whatever level of resources was necessary to meet that global crisis. I don't think it's quite so straightforward, however. I, I think that that would be what happened if both Russia and China launched major unprovoked assaults on U.S. interests. If you could sort of replay Pearl Harbor, I think that would lead to a large and rapid mobilization of U.S. manpower and industrial resources. It's not necessarily the case, though, if what you're looking at are limited wars that began in ambiguous ways in theaters thousands of miles from American uh, shores, whether that's in the South China Sea uh, or the Taiwan Strait uh, or, or the Baltic. Under these conditions, I think, I'm just not sure there would be significant popular and political support for uh, even a limited U.S. military response, let alone for marshalling uh, a national mobilization effort. And even if it was, it's just not clear that the United States has the industrial base or will have the industrial base anytime soon to rapidly ramp up the production of munitions and platforms in the way that, that you would need to. And so this one is, is not super realistic. So I, I think all of this uh, brings us to what I consider to be the, the heart of the matter, which is that there is a growing imbalance between US defense strategy and the larger grand strategy that the national defense strategy is meant to support. And so if you read the 2017 national security strategy or you read the 2018 national defense strategy, it's clear that the United States isn't planning to retrench geopolitically. I mean, we remain committed to this longstanding three theater grand strategy that aims to preserve stability and uphold favorable balances of power in Europe, the Middle East, and the Indo-Pacific. Trump has been a little bit ambivalent about the Middle East, and yet he has nonetheless managed to get the United States closer to a war with Iran than we've been in a number of, of years. But the issue is that the NDS essentially acknowledges that the Washington has about one theater's worth of military power if war breaks out. And so if you follow DOD's own logic, going back to the 1990s, that the ability to respond to more than one challenge at a time is, is critical to America's global credibility and confidence, then a one more standard uh, is damaging. It could affect the calculations of policymakers in the United States uh, and, and around the world. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just think about the view from Washington. If the United States knows that fighting Iran or North Korea is going to seriously undermine its ability to defeat China or Russia, then presumably U.S. officials would be less likely to act assertively in response to provocations by Tehran or Pyongyang, although I guess people can differ on whether they think that's a good thing or, or a bad thing. Uh, if an American president understands that a conflict with China or Russia is going to eat up the country's global combat power, uh, she may be less willing to risk war in a crisis over Taiwan or the South China Sea or the Baltic for fear of leaving America strategically exposed somewhere else. And so what, what some uh, advocates have warned, with, or sorry, what some analysts have warned, which I think is a little bit of an exaggeration, but not a total exaggeration, is you could unintentionally end up 
with something like a zero war strategy rather than a one war strategy because short short of an outrageous provocation the risk of committing the u.s military anywhere would seem very very high uh so I, and I think also the fact that the U.S. is executing a three-theater grand strategy at the one-war military isn't going to be lost on, on other countries, and it will affect their calculations as well. And we run through some scenarios in the paper for how this uh, would work, although I'm going to skip some of that just for, for reasons of time. I, I think the basic challenge here is that every global power, whether that's the British Empire in the 19th century or the U.S. during the Cold War or today, faces a basic dilemma, which is that it can't possibly meet all of the threats to its interests if those threats manifest at or near the same time. That, that problem is unavoidable. That problem isn't the fault of the national defense strategy. But I think the one more strategy really sharpens this dilemma by widening the gap between the number of theaters in which the U.S. is committed and the number of theaters in which it can plausibly uh, respond. Now, I want to be clear about one thing, which is that the national defense strategy is is right on a big issue, which is that DOD shouldn't just go back to business as usual if it means focusing on relatively weak rivals at the expense of transforming the military to, to deal with hostile great powers. A world in which the U.S. has the force structure to defeat North Korea and Iran at the same time, but it doesn't have the advanced capabilities and concepts that are needed to defeat China or Russia would be incredibly dangerous from the perspective of American alliances and, and geopolitical strategy. And so I think to remain relevant in today's environment, any defense strategy does have to keep great powers in, in the focus. We, we do have to figure out how to win a war with China over Taiwan or Russia and the Baltic, and that's going to require some serious innovation and, and frankly, some serious investments. The downside, though, is that in trying to buy down the risk of losing that one big war, we, we may increase the risk in other areas. And frankly, we're not being particularly candid about that. And, and there's no magic formula for solving this problem. There are steps the United States can take to narrow the gap between its defense strategy and its global commitments. We can push allies to strengthen their defense capabilities. We can uh, modernize America's nuclear arsenal and develop better limited options. We can improve the country's mobilization base and so on. But we, we should frankly be doing that under any defense strategy, and they're still not going to fully close the gap that the NDS uh, reveals. And so I, th I think the shift to a one more standard is actually bringing the U.S. closer to a more fundamental choice, where it can either pare back its commitments to bring them into alignment with existing resources, or it can increase its resources to better meet, meet existing commitments. There are various ways you can go about this, and Evan and I had a slight disagreement about this, and so we fudge it a little bit uh, in the paper. It's clear the United States is not going to get to anything like a two great power standard, let alone a 2.5 war or a three war standard. The last time the United States even notionally had a 2.5 war standard, we were spending about 9% of GDP on defense, which is well over twice what the United States is, is spending today. In, in the paper, we end up arguing for something like a 1.5 war standard, something that, that combines the capabilities needed to defeat a Russia or China with the capacity to fight uh, you know, a regional power more or less at the same time, or it gives you more cushion in case the first war uh, go, goes worse than, than you think. But I think we, we acknowledge that even this would be a pretty considerable expense. It, it would probably require sustained increases in defense spending at a time when most people expect defense spending to be flat uh, for the coming years. And that's in addition to all the operational creativity we would need to figure out how to defeat more capable uh, opponents. And so while, while my preference would be to avoid the approach of simply writing off commitments, I, I think that would be quite dangerous for, for reasons that I've specified, uh, drawing on a lot of the work that, that Bill uh, and Steve Brooks have done over the years. I, I can see how people would get there given the strategic context and the resource uh, constraints. Uh, and so I, I think that just the hard reality is the United States isn't going to be able to do everything with, with less money. It's going to have to confront this more fundamental choice sooner or later. And I think the worst thing we could do is simply to assume that the choice can, can be avoided because the worst approach to dealing with an increasingly glaring strategic problem is basically to pretend that it, it doesn't exist. So I'll, I'll stop there and I look forward to Andy's comments and the discussion. Yeah, Andy, take it away. Great. Well, thanks so much. Um, so thanks for, for presenting the paper. I think it's terrific. Um, and I think it's probably the most important topic that people outside of defense policy circles are not regularly talking about. And so I'm really pleased to be able to, to talk about it. And as you mentioned, it, uh, it's near and dear to my heart as, as something that I, I used to work on. Um, so I'll describe what I see as a few of the strengths of the paper. And then I'll ask a few questions about areas that I, I would have liked to, to hear a little bit more about. 
Um, so on the positive side, I think you really clearly identify this mismatch between, on the one hand, the 2017 national security strategy's ambition of remaining actively engaged in the world and being able to stabilize three, um, three critical regions, um, and then the capabilities that the NDS is actually um, committed to deliver. And so we have this Lipman gap, and you put a really fine point on it, which I think is, is useful for sort of, you know, shaking our collective consciences to understand that we're on, we're standing in the middle of the tracks and the, the train may run us over if we don't, you know, get off on one side or the other. And so I think, um, I think it's really, really valuable uh, for that. Um, I also appreciate that it moves past the common practice of comparing uh, top line uh, military budgets of various countries to determine whether a military is big enough um, and shifts to asking what the military is, is sized to do and built to do. I think that's, that's critical if we're gonna have a, have a serious analysis of how much we ought to be spending. Um, it also introduces uh, force planning dilemmas uh, to a non-expert audience uh, in a way that is, is really accessible, frankly, um, but still provides enough substance, I think, to be useful for academics and for policy folks um, that are grappling with grand strategic choices. And, and lastly, I think um, this is no small thing, um, it helps to make sense of how this administration has approached uh, the formal strategic documents that it's issued. I think in many uh, respects, the strategic documents uh, from this administration have been uh, more serious than the than the sort of the public uh, stance of many of the, the key figures. Uh, and many of them are quite, they're quite serious. We can agree or disagree, but they're, they're, they're serious documents. And I think you, um, your comparison to Atchison is, is, really, is really apt. The idea of like bludgeoning the mass mind of government to say, you are accountable for the high-end fight. You must get this right, so focus on this. I think it's really, really helpful. Um, and it creates this uh, clear discontinuity with previous strategies, including ones that I was, um, I was involved in, frankly, that were kind of like Christmas trees that everybody hung their, um, their policy priorities on like ornaments. And so we didn't offend anybody, but we also didn't uh, shape the direction of the department perhaps as, as much as we could have. Um, I was puzzled uh, by your articulation of the downsides of losing a conflict with China or Russia though. So you cite a loss of alliances and a shift in the, the regional balances of power as, as the two you know, sort of clearest downsides. And I agree that those are likely consequences, um, but I wanna push you a little bit because I see alliances as a means to win a war that we would fight for other reasons. Um, so I don't see alliances as an end in themselves. Um, and similarly, the regional balances of power are shifting um, already, regardless of whether we end up fighting or not. So that's not, that's not an obvious consequence for me of, of losing a war. And so I came away understanding that you're really concerned about losing a, a great power war, but unsure of exactly what, what is at stake in that conflict. Um, and so I think there's a couple of possibilities. Um, you know, one is that we're, what we're really worried about is balance of power. And so it may be a sort of a long-term peacetime competition kind of a frame, or it may be a preparation for war kind of frame, but balance of power is really the fundamental thing. The other possibility is that I think you may have a, a sort of a latent claim about how the international order would change if we lost a conflict to Russia or China. Um, and that's an area that I know you've thought a lot about. And so I'd love to draw out a little bit more um, what you worry about in terms of the, the terms of order that we would, um, that we would want to preserve or create. Um, related to the issue of allies, um, I wanted to push you a little bit to understand what sorts of support and how much support we can reasonably expect from allies. You know, in your description, they seem to be simultaneously so important that losing them is one of the two main downsides of losing a systemic war, and yet they're simultaneously unable to defend themselves without us. And those two things strike me as being somewhat in tension with each other. Um, on a more technical side, I wonder how long of a lead time you think we would have to observe uh, Chinese mobilization for a Taiwan conflict. And so I'm, what I'm thinking of is, you know, if we're engaged in uh, a regional conflict, say with Iran, uh, and we're in, we're in the midst of conventional operations, you know, how much time do we have before um, the PLA launches a major attack? Uh, and does that give us enough time to impose sufficient costs in the first conflict? Even if we haven't stabilized or finished the conflict, can we, can basically, can we, to be, you know, sort of crass about it, can we break enough to sort of, you know, leave that on hold to, uh, to then shift over for the Taiwan conflict? Um, you note that the potential to have a broad-based national mobilization uh, doesn't resolve the strategic insolvency that we're facing. Um, and I think that's right, but you, there's a, there was a specific justification that I wanted to, to, to drill down on a bit more. And so you argue that the public wouldn't support that mobilization unless there were a major provocation. And that the, the leaders in Russia and China are basically smart enough to, to know this and would avoid that sort of major provocation. 
And so the, the types of attacks that we'd be most likely to see would be limited and asymmetric. And I think that's right, but that raises the question for me, wouldn't the capabilities that we would need for those limited asymmetric attacks be different than the more conventional capabilities that would be tied down in the other theater? So it seems to me you've either got a demand for um, a large number of conventional capabilities in both theaters, and you've had a major attack that would trigger mobilization, or you've got a demand in one theater for those conventional capabilities and a demand for more um, limited uh, specialized capabilities in another. Um, so that was something I wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, very briefly, I don't want to take up too much um, more airtime here. Um, I really like your point about uh, the industrial base not being able to surge sufficiently in a conflict. I think that's incredibly important and one that doesn't get enough attention. Um, and so I'm curious to get your thoughts on sort of how we're doing at mitigating that problem um, and where we, we would focus next and where would you spend your next dollar. Um, lastly, <laughs> I hope I'm not out of turn uh, with this, but I, I thought your one and a half horse standard, I know you mentioned that you and Evan um, maybe had some disagreement on this. It felt to me like it was a bit driven by you reading the room in Washington and discerning what might be feasible rather than as an argument for what the strategic right, the right strategic answer is. And so I want to pull that thread a little bit. So the, the logic of the two workforce planning construct as you've laid out really clearly is that you got to be able to fight in one theater um, and avoid opportunistic and aggression in another. Um, but what's the logic for stopping there, right? Why not a three war standard or a four war standard, right? So that's incredibly unlikely, I realize. Um, but a single massive war with China or Russia is already incredibly unlikely. And then you add the additional probability of, of the Iranians or the North Koreans attacking. And we're already planning for really unlikely scenarios. And so it's not clear to me why the two war standard or one and a half is the, is the, the right place to stop. And so I wonder if this was uh, driven as much by um, uh, a sense that this is the sort of the most of the pie that we can get. And so let's, let's push for one and a half. Um, so I'll leave it there. I think this is a tremendous paper, and I hope I hope the questions um, raise some some useful fodder for discussion. Yeah, terrific uh, comments, Randy. I, do you do you want me to take these on, or do you want do we want to collect yeah, questions or add, what? what? What about the Martians? You have to add the Martians too. We could have Russia, China, right. and the Martians. <laughs> That's right. Well, if the Martians come, then I I think all of our earthly conflicts will be resolved. So I'm I'm <laughs> less worried. Oh, you don't know Putin. I mean, have you seen the Democrats for the last No, morning? but I've I've seen the movie really? Independence Day. So I, yeah. Just send them to Beijing; it'll be fine. So let me let me um take a crack at at a few of these, and let me start with with the last one. Um, yeah, this this was based as much on an understanding of what is politically feasible as you know, what our ideal scenario might be. Cause you know, we, we published this, I think in early March where it was, it was clear that already it was clear that the most likely trajectory for the defense budget was downward in real terms. And you were starting to get all of the likely costs of COVID layered on, on top of that. And so we ended up with 1.5 wars because what we're basically trying to do is, is close the gap as much as we can recognizing that doing more is probably just not politically possible, right, for, for the coming period and that doing less is, is too dangerous or walking away from the commitments is, is too dangerous. But, but absolutely, right, the, this is the ultimate argument that we make is one that um, is informed by both our sort of geopolitical and military analysis, but also our analysis of, of what's politically feasible. So I think that, that's a fair comment on um, how much time would you need or how much time would you have prior to, let's say, a Russian or a Chinese attack on their neighbors? I mean, pe people will tell you different things. I mean, there are some people in the intelligence world or close to it who will swear to you that we'll have 30 days, you know, tactical warning of a Chinese assault on Taiwan. I, I don't believe that for a second, just because the last time either the Russians or the Chinese use force in a significant way, we were blindsided by it in, in 2014. And there, there were indications, you know, there were indications that the Russians were moving forces and so on and so forth. But because they did it in the guise of exercises and things like that, we, we had far less warning than you might expect. I understand Taiwan is a little bit different than Ukraine because the geography is different and so on and so forth. But if the Chinese get into a posture where they are holding menacing exercises on a regular basis, which is kind of where it looks like things are going, you might have 
uh, less early warning than, than you, might, you might think, or at least you can't plan on having you know, one to two months of, of advanced warning. On the question of if the conflicts are limited and asymmetric, uh, wouldn't you need fewer forces or need different forces? Maybe, right? But it, so it could be that the conflicts start in an asymmetric and ambiguous way, but then they escalate relatively quickly, right? And so that's kind of the, the Baltic scenario that a lot of people talk about. My, my hunch, though, is that even, so let's, let's say there's a scenario where the Russians, um, you know, regardless whether you think this is plausible or not, the Russians grab a small chunk of territory in the Baltic in an ambiguous way. And then the debate in the North Atlantic Council starts about what to do. I don't think the NAC is doing anything if the United States says we're only sending a small force because we're going to keep a lot of other things in reserve to deal with the potential of a similar ambiguous you know, Chinese strike in, in the Western Pacific. I think the NAC is going to want to know that the United States is bringing everything it has to deal with, or at least has the capability to bring everything it has to deal with the Russians. And so I think Maybe in a purely military sense, that, that's right, but in a, a, a political military sense, I think the calculation is a little bit different. Um, with respect to you know, what happens if you lose a conflict with Russia and China, you're right. I mean, allies are a means to an end. We don't, we don't have allies as ends in themselves, but, but you can still think that the means is important enough, say, to upholding a favorable regional environment that it would be bad for you if your alliance or alliances were to crack as a result of losing a conflict. And so what, what happens, I think, if the United States loses a war for Taiwan, you know, maybe the Japanese stick with us in the Western Pacific because they're our closest allies and they really don't have a lot of other good options. But if I were a policymaker in Seoul or in Manila or in Singapore and a variety of other places, I would probably become more accommodating of Chinese power at that point in a way that has downstream implications, uh, not for China overrunning the entire region, right? I, I think that is unlikely, but for shifting the diplomatic, the economic, and the geopolitical climate in a way that, that ultimately makes it harder for the United States to influence events there in the way that we, since World War II, we have defined it as being in our interest uh, to do so. And so, so it is kind of a relatively abstract view of, of what happens, and it depends a lot on kind of downstream calculations of, of officials. And so we, we didn't get into that in great detail in the paper just for reasons of, of space, but I think you're right, that it is important to spell that out. And then on just on the allies question, you know, allies are uh, additive for the United States, right? They, may, they make it easier for us to uphold the balance of power or the regional environment that we want in the Persian Gulf or in the Middle East or wherever to prevent bad actors from destabilizing or dominating those regions. But the way the, the way the addition works is that it's, it's not enough for them to do it on their own. And so I don't, I don't think these things are necessarily contradictory in, in part because I think one of the things we have found, or at least one of, one of the um, implicit beliefs of American statecraft, which people argue about, and the offshore balancers would contest this, but I, I think it's true, is that we are actually more likely to get more constructive performance out of our allies by, by leading and by helping resolve the collective action problems than we are if we say, all right, you guys figure it out on, on your own, right? I think, I think that's probably a formula for having all of the you know, political disputes in the Persian Gulf come to the surface and, and things like that. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Those are great, great questions and I'd, I'd love to discuss all of them uh, at a, with about an hour each uh, with you over a beer sometime. Thanks, Alex, that's, ter that's terrific. I have a question, but I'm not going to ask it because I have a feeling John Mueller is going to ask it anyway, and he, he's off that. If he doesn't, I'm going after it. Go ahead, John. Can't hear you. You must be muted. No, you're not muted. John. You're, no, you're muted, John. Unmute. Oh, okay. Let me ask. Let me unmute you. Okay. Hold on, hold on. No, you can talk. For some reason, you're muted. Okay, go ahead. Nope, you're muted. Uh, disabled, uh, talking? Uh, uh. I'll get you, don't worry, I will get it. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Okay. <laughs>
uh, skipping past the Martians, um, though I would like you to talk a little bit about the, the, the thing that uh, Andy brought up about the likelihood of these things happening. Um, they can be catastrophic, but they can also be incredibly small possibility. But it seems to me the main things you talked about were attacks in the Baltics and the attack and attack on Taiwan. Now, it seems to me if that happened, uh, the number of American people would say, would you like to go to World War III over either of those things would be rather small. And the reaction would be basically like Afghanistan, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. In other words, a relatively cheap war from the standpoint of the United States, assuming there are locals who are willing to fight uh, on, uh, uh, that can be supported. So consequently, this would not be World War III. This would be Afghanistan. That was very painful war and so forth. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, very much a constrained one. It didn't escalate from there. If you think there would be a big escalation from there, you'd need to explain that. Uh, the other quite the issue is about the uh, the your first position about uh, the Brit the military basically um, changing its mind. It was actually in 2012 that they said they were giving up. Um, they're not no longer be uh, capable of long term stability operations, as they put it. So I'm wondering if some of the policy change was because of their abject failure. Uh, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, which has led to extremely long wars, extremely costly wars, and ones that have led, resulted in hundreds of thousands of dead. The American military actually has no record, not much record of success at all since World War II. The only wars it's won have been in uh, uh, Grenada, Panama, the uh, first Gulf War, and, and Kosovo, where basically the enemy scarcely existed. So I, I'm not sure how much you want to talk about how they're going to win a war against China or or or, this, or Russia. I I guess I don't see the relevance of the second question, but I'm I'm happy to take on the the first question. Okay. Um, so on the the first question, I I just would be curious, why wouldn't it be the invasion of South Korea, right? Why is the Afghanistan example more compelling to you than the 1950 North Korean invasion of South Korea, where well, that was a case where we didn't have a defense commitment to South Korea, and yet we decided we had to come in for a number of the reasons that would be in play, say, in a Russian invasion of Estonia or a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. So I'd, I'd just be curious to hear more why you think about, why you think it would be Afghanistan. Well, as opposed uh, to because they, they had, because they, there was a possibility, obviously, in Afghanistan was passed by. Uh, Korea, and Korea was extremely costly, but it still wasn't World War III. It was called, in fact, a limited war. Um, it, it is the worst war since World War II. And of course, there hasn't been anything like that for 70 years. Right. Um, so consequently, it seems that the Afghanistan thing is much more likely. If you've got Estonians who are willing to fight, we'll try to help them, we'll put on sanctions, uh, we'll uh, work with other allies who are, who are threatened by this, et cetera. And the, same with, and the same with Taiwan. If Taiwanese basically just surrender, which is very unlikely given that they're pretty well built up, uh, then, um, then presumably China would be able to take over. So I guess one significant difference is that the United States has defense commitments, whether formal or ambiguous, to the Baltic states and Taiwan in a way that it did not in Afghanistan. And I, I don't know that any American official considers that a war over Taiwan would be World War III or that a war of the Baltic would be World War III. I think the idea is that it would be an extremely intense limited war with the potential for escalation, but you would try to limit that escalation in various ways. And so my, my hunch, based on nothing but what I read in the newspapers, is that the earlier concept, which was reported widely for basically going and uh, wiping out Chinese command and control on the mainland in the, ev in the event of a conflict in the Western Pacific, you know, has probably been downgraded somewhat for, for a variety of reasons. And we would try to uh, defeat an invasion of Taiwan in uh, uh, less escalatory ways. And so one of the things that has been talked about, for instance, uh, Michelle Flournoy published a piece about this a couple months ago, is basically, you know, the question is, can you sink two to 300 Chinese amphibs in the space of 48 to 72 hours? And, and whether that's the right metric or not, we can argue about. But I think that's indicative of the sort of approach that the United States would take to trying to uh, defeat an, an attack on Taiwan, because by all indications, you know, the, the Baltic states certainly can't defend themselves without NATO's help. I think it would be extremely difficult for Taiwan 
to maintain its sovereignty in the face of a determined Chinese attack. It would be different if it were sort of uh, in a, some sort of ambiguous scenario. They can add one more thing about Korea. That was seen to be World War III at the top. That's basically what Harry Truman said. You got to stop there or else the communist international conspiracy, et cetera, is going to take over everywhere. And that would not be the case. That was not seen to be the case very much in Afghanistan, though, a little bit. So that's no, the, but the, the argument in Korea not was, was not, not that... Yeah. The argument in Korea was not that Korea itself would be used as a launch pad for attacks elsewhere. The idea was that if the United States did not thwart flagrant international aggression just five years after World War II, that would essentially shatter the psychological balance of power, not simply in East Asia and, and elsewhere. Well, they, and the, the situation. Jesus, is, they're convinced they're going to be in. They're going to be in. Be in West Europe the next week. Or in I, I, no, I mean that's that's not historically accurate. Okay, we're going to go to this is good. I'm sure we could continue this. Uh, Bill Wilforth and then Tim Luca. We'll just ask a series of questions, to, uh, and then we'll go ahead, Bill. I guess my question is following from the last question of Andy and then John Mueller's question. So again, we're just pushing on the same thing, but I want to do it just a little bit differently. I thought the <clears throat> I beg your pardon. I thought the paper and the presentation were excellent. But I did see this kind of dichotomous thinking about American commitments. In other words, we have X number of commitments and Y amount of resources. And if Y and X don't equate, if Y is too small, we have to cut X. But I just wanted to suggest another way of thinking about it, which is there's a continuum rather than a dichotomy of how the United States seeks to fulfill its commitments. And in that perfect world, of course, the United States would be able to credibly and decisively deter or defend every single ally. So in a perfect world, we'd be so powerful that we could literally defend Estonia if Estonia were somehow, for some reason, which is very unlikely, seized by Russia. But I think today we're already in a situation where I don't think that's credible. I just don't see any reasonable path that the United States would be able to do that. So that when your resources decline, you get a Lippmann gap you could just, you could pare down commitments or you could go for cleverer, smarter, more lean and mean, you know, more, um, um, less absolutist, less perfect uh, strategies to fulfill those commitments that you've had in the past. I am not in Washington the way you are. I don't interact with these people the way you do. I just sometimes get the impression that the United States Pentagon is just not used to thinking that way. They want, they, they don't like that kind of, Oh, I know they would maybe put it kind of, you know, you know, imperfect off the cuff, back of the envelope type of thing. I think actually that's what Russia has been doing uh, in its foreign policy for the last 10 years. They've been doing cheap strategies. I don't see why we are not thinking about cheap strategies in response. So in, in, in response to a Baltic scenario, why would the United States necessarily respond symmetrically? Why would it necessarily respond even in the Baltics? Why does it even have to go there? So I think John Mueller's point was less, was less about, was, was more about the idea that there was a lot of ways the United States could respond to impose costs on Russia, that it could telegraph in advance to, in some sense, deter Russia, that falls short of credibly defending what is really indefensible. And I think, I'm not the expert, but I just look at a map. I don't see how you defend Estonia. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that, that pro given the low probability of this happening in the first place, why would that necessarily not, why would that not necessarily work? Yeah. So it's, it's a great question. And this is, this is the problem with the Lippmann gap as it is traditionally understood, right? Which is that you have to have exactly enough force and capabilities to cover all of your commitments. And as we put out in the paper, that, that's never actually true. The United States has never had enough military force to cover all of its global commitments. The, the question is, how, how big is the gap, right? And there have been times where the gap is massive. In 1949, the gap is massive between America's commitments and what it can actually do to defend them. In 1953, it's less, right? And so there, there are different uh, costs and, and benefits associated with all that. So I think we're not, what we're not trying to say is that you've got to get back to being able to defeat all threats at the same time, right? We would be advocating like a three plus four strategy if that was the case. We're saying that the in, in our judgment, and it's necessarily a subjective judgment, you are running more risk than is necessary when the gap gets this large. Now, one of the reasons we're willing to say that is that I, I, I guess I would differ on the question of whether 
Estonia is, let's say, or Latvia or Lithuania is uh, defensible. And so if the question is, do you have to be able to throw back a Russian invasion force at the border, then yes, they, they are indefensible for reasons of, of geography. But if you think that what you really need is just a force that is capable enough and big enough to avoid losing quickly, right? Because the Russians presumably would be far less attracted by the prospect of an extended war vis-a-vis uh, -vis NATO because they know they will lose that in the end than the fait accompli, which then allows them to say, all right, now let's talk peace. If all you need is the ability to convince the Russians that they can't win in a few days or a few weeks, then what you're talking about is not actually a massive military presence in, in the Baltics. It's, it's probably you know, a few brigades that are in or near the area and the ability to project more power in quickly. And that's, that's actually doable, I think, at an acceptable cost. Um, the question about sort of, you know, horizontal escalation or asymmetric responses is, is interesting. And, uh, you know, Michael O'Hanlon has just published a book about this, where he, he basically takes the, the Woolforth argument and says, it, it would be crazy for the United States to respond to a Chinese seizure of the Senkakus or some other, you know, relatively minor stakes with a conventional military response. What we ought to do is kind of slap on sanctions, impose diplomatic costs, hurt them in other areas so that ultimately it would make it not worth the price. I think that the challenge you run into there is that, you know, we tend to underestimate how much coercion it will actually take to get uh, an aggressor disgorge something that they have eaten, right? And so the United States has slapped sanctions after sanctions on, on the Russians after Ukraine. I mean, the sanctions regime is far stronger and is held in place far more effectively than anybody would have guessed in 2014, and there's literally no indication that the Russians are prepared to pull back from any of the positions they uh, have held there. And you, you can look at, you know, we, we know that compellence is much harder than deterrence and, and so on and so forth. And so I, I actually think of the not lose quickly strategy as kind of the military equivalent of the crafty or the imperfect strategy. You don't have to be able to win the war in the first 30 days. You just have to be able to avoid losing it, because if the Russians know that, I think they're, they're much less likely to take the risk. Pal, can I just, I'm just going to, I'll get Tim in a second. I just, I have to piggyback on this, because I, I was like, I'm going to speak for the Trump types, okay? Why in the world would the United States have to do anything in the Baltics when you consider that Germany alone has three times the GDP per capita as Russia. It has 69% larger GDP overall, forget per capita. So Europe, that's just Germany. So if Europe isn't willing to do anything about the Baltics, why the heck should America commit to anyone? I know they're in NATO, it's crazy. That Latvia, if you ask most America, Americans, any Americans, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, they're in NATO. Oh, you have an Article 5 commitment. But they'd be like, what, what does that mean? What is Latvia? What is Lithuania? What is that? They'd say, is that an air conditioner or what is it? You know, they have no idea. And you know what? They're right. They're right, not Washington. Who cares? It's not our problem. You say Russia's in, Russia's in Ukraine. Oh my gosh, yes, they took over territory where 70% of the people are Russians. And if they could vote, they'd probably vote to be back in Russia. I thought we believed in voting and I thought we believed in self-determination, but whatever. How in the world, I had a debate with Jake Sullivan. He was saying kind of like what you're saying. But I asked him, what state in Western Europe is Russia gonna overtake? What, who are they gonna conquer? Nobody. And if they do, my gosh, that's on Europe. It's not on us. The Cold War has been over for almost 30 years, 30 years now. We're still talking about defending, we're talking about defending Estonia, like you'd think that we would have pulled back. But we're talking about defending Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia from a Russian attack. It's just, I'm just putting it forth as a, as a Trumpian. This is the kind of crazy, crazy talk that passes for like, this is sanity in DC. This, this is called, this is called, you know, defending Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania is called serious thinking in DC. I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. The, the explain where my logic is wrong. I, I would love to see Germany do more to support its- Well, they're never gonna Baltic do it if we keep telling them we're gonna do it for them. 
no, no, they're never going to do it if they lose the American security commitment. Get, get, get rid of the American right. security commitment. Let's get out. Well, no, but, but, no, no, but you're, you're, not, you're not hearing me. What, I, what I'm saying, and this comes back to, I think, the, the point about mid-range theory, this comes down to a, a, a mid-range theory judgment about whether you think countries who are presently American allies are more or less likely to behave in the way that the United States would like them to behave once the United States says, screw it, we're out of here. I think it's less likely. Right? If you talk, Bar Barry and Steve and John, they think it's more likely. They think that as soon as the United States tells the Europeans to go to hell, the Europeans will do what like them to do in terms of stabilizing the continent and resisting Russian power. Oh, wait I think that's insane. But wait, Hal, just wait a second. I just, and I, I love your work. I'm just, I'm just having a debate. That's what we're doing, debating, right? I'm being Trump, okay? I talk like Trump. I'm a New Yorker like Trump. Okay, listen, you say, tell the Europeans to go to hell. I never should go to hell with the Europeans. I'm just saying, it's your freaking continent. You, you take care of it. Why, why, is telling, why is allowing Germany and the rest of Europe to take care of their own yard, backyard, telling them to go to hell? Only in DC does that make sense. It's like saying, if, like, let's say I was saying, Bill Wolford. I said, Bill, I'm no longer cleaning your house anymore for nothing. I'm not doing it. You're going to have to clean your own house. Am I telling them to go to hell? I'm saying, I'm no longer going to do it for you because I don't have the, we don't share the common enemy. I don't care anymore. It's 30 years later. Why, why is this? You see, when I hear you say this, it scares me. It frightens me that you talk like this because you're a very smart person. So is Jake Sullivan. And he'll probably be secretary of something when he, when, if Biden wins, God forbid. But let's say he does. And I just don't understand a word you're saying. Like, I don't understand. Like, when is enough enough? Like, what, when does America get to go home? Ever? Do we ever get to go home? How rich does Europe have to be relative to Russia before we say, you can defend Russia against Russia? A hundred times stronger? Randy, so, can, I, can I reframe your question slightly? Forgive me for, <laughs> for jumping in. So, you're, I mean, you're talking about a change to the national security strategy, right? And Hal is sort of taking the national security strategy as, as fixed, yeah. right? Because we have this strategic guidance. Now, what do we do in the military side? And so I guess what I'm curious about from you, Randy, is given the commitment to these countries, and I share your skepticism that we should have them in the first place, but we do, how do you, how do you, how do you structure the military? Would you take that risk in the hope that the Germans will see the risk and that they'll step up? I don't care what the Germans do. Europe will, Europe will never do anything if we do it for them. It's a simple principle. You know, like I said, if I'm cleaning Bill's house, is he going to do it himself? No. I come every week to do it. Why is he going to do it? But this, it's just the, it's like the hubris and, and arrogance of DC that they think that Taiwan, Lithuania, Latvia, they're all our problems. They're all, the, the American people should be, Dying, fighting, pay, how many, how much money? Like, you know how much money we spend on things like NATO and the Persian Gulf to make sure that oil goes to China? Like, it just- A lot less than you actually think it is, Randy, is the it's answer. It's not a lot less. You are answer. wildly exaggerating the Tell me how much it is, tell me how much. Tell I've me. got it in my paper and I showed you the estimates on- Trillion. You said a 1.4 trillion total. No, but that's total. All offshore balance, and the European, the European piece of that is really not that big, especially since we get some help. Tell me what's out. not that so big. The though. budgetary expenditures, sort of the budget spare expenditures is not that big a deal. Tell me what's not that big a deal. Randy, this is the, I will balance the federal budget by cutting foreign aid. Our, I didn't say that. Don't put words strategy. in my mouth. I you didn't say anything about balancing a budget. Here. And I'm sorry, I'm just calling bullshit on this. It's, it's a- I didn't it's say a, anything about argument. balancing a budget. I didn't say I was gonna balance a budget. I'm just saying- No, I'm saying it's that kind of argument. Okay, of so, so if it's a few- if it's, How much this is supposed to cost. So if it's a few billion every couple of years, that's okay, because the American taxpayer will pay for it. Yes, that's exactly oh, right. Great. That's exactly okay. right. If it's a few billion dollars a year, okay. that is chump change, Randy. And okay. I'm not sure why you're so exercised about it. Be uh, forget it. It's like I was saying, that this is why you don't understand Trump voters. This is why you don't understand half the country. Because half how the that, country- How'd just, that work out, Randy? I mean, he hasn't, he hasn't pulled back on those commitments. We still formally no, I, have. Because he can't, because people like the establishment would, would put him in a straitjacket. They would, if he did half the things he's thinking about doing, his own people resign in protest. 
but uh, that's okay. I'm just throwing out different debates. So, so the, the Occam's razor explanation for this might be that we don't pull back from these commitments because they actually make sense because they're actually cheaper in, in the long run. And so I, I think that could be, you know, you, you can explain it by, you know, nefarious cliques and the blob and all these people who get in the way of good uh, intentions to pull back from the world. But my guess is that if it was really as obviously wrong as some of its critics say it was, we would have we gotten away from it by now. Just like Afghanistan, Iraq, clearly, clearly those are brilliant decisions. They, it, it must be that they're right. And, and, you know, what I don't understand though is why people like, you know, uh, Bolton and people have been wrong for like 30 years are still called experts. It's just, I'm, I, I'm still- The same reason to, we call academics experts. Right, but I'm still trying to figure out why, but we don't let them run anything. But I'm, I'm sure, I'm still trying to figure out what you have to do how wrong, spectacularly wrong you have to be to be for someone to say, hey, we don't really care what you think anymore, but that's okay. I'm, I'm just throwing it out. Tim, you go ahead. I'm not saying you help. Trust me, I love your work. I'm not, I'm not, this has nothing to do with you. I, it really doesn't. It has nothing I, to do with I, you. I, I, I can tell it has nothing to do with me. How, how does it have something to do? I'm, I'm totally- No, no, I'm, I'm being serious. <laughs> I know it has nothing to do with you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just throwing out there what a Trump person would say in response to this whole thing. Okay. Tim. Wow. Um, <laughs> well, this was really fun. <laughs> I think this was a very good, especially sitting here in Cologne, Germany. Um, I actually agree with a lot of the things uh, I um, both sides said that <laughs> speaks to the debate. Um, yeah, there's, there's probably a case that, I mean, the Germans are obviously thinking very hard and I think Ms. Merkel is, is realizing, um, has realized for a while that they need to really seriously step up the security commitment and expenditures on that. So, so maybe we all, you know, can go home and, and be happy at some point. Um, but actually, yeah, this, this showed um, one point I wanted to make before I sort of ask my question, which is uh, I, I think it's incredible um, sort of the breadth of the speakers we had here today already, and we're not done. We just get then. I mean, we started with our artsy fartsy and let's talk to Trump uh, supporters and opponents um, presentation. And we had David who had interviews about elites who had Bill, who talked about grand strategy, and now we have a defense official who really knows what he's talking about. I mean, it's just, wow, it's mind blown. So a very good job, Rani, on, on, on and whoever else helped with the schedule. And that brings me to my, my question, which is more of a sort of, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand a bit more of how these defense sort of plans work, Hell, um, and I did really like the talk, thanks. Um, but I was wondering, so you talk about there was the plan to first go against two separate scenarios with like more regional powers and then there's the one war scenario with like a power and what I was thinking the entire time like where exactly and that's sort of the question does nuclear deterrence play into all this <clears throat> because you always talk about yes and then this war is going to happen and this is going to play out Obviously, first of all, that's very different with the regional power than with China or Russia, especially given its nuclear arsenal. And to me, it just, and maybe that's just because I'm not a defense official, but to me, it just sounded like you're just um, talking about conventional war entirely. Yeah. Or I misunderstood you and you're talking about you go all out nuclear right off the bat, which I, yes, I think that's less likely. So if you could just clarify to me what sort of the role um, nuclear deterrence plays in all of this, that yeah. would be cool. So I, I, think, I think this is actually one of the big unanswered questions in US defense strategy today. So, you know, in, in theory, the United States has always stayed away from a no first use pledge because we want to reserve the right to use nuclear weapons first in a conflict where we fail or are in danger of failing to defend our allies with 
conventional forces. Now, now Biden has sort of hinted that he might adopt a no first use pledge, which would be a major change in American strategy, which is why I don't think it's actually going to happen. But, but none, nonetheless, so in theory, the United States, you know, might be willing to use nuclear weapons to do this. I, I think in practice, the odds of that are, are nil almost just because, uh, you know, well, I think Randy and I probably disagree on what the stakes are in a place like Taiwan or Latvia, I, I just think it would be extremely hard to explain to the American people why the United States is starting even a limited nuclear war over, over these countries. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, the, the RAND Corporation has, has worked on this. And when you ask people, you know, they run lots of war games and you ask them, you know, under what circumstances do nuclear weapons come into play when you put you know, people who know the Russian military very well and who know the American military very well, they say they, they don't, right? That the United States just doesn't even think about them in defending Taiwan or the Baltic. Now that's, that's changing a little bit. I mean, if, if you read the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review, there is an emphasis on developing limited nuclear options where you would fire off a couple of nuclear weapons in some way or another if, say, the Russians threatened to escalate or, or presumably if you needed to introduce nuclear weapons because you were losing conventionally. But, but again, I, I, just don't, I just don't find that particularly realistic. I think the United States will either, and NATO will either succeed in defending the Baltics conventionally or, or they will fail. I just, I just don't see the, I don't see a political pathway to nuclear escalation. So if I can follow up just really quick, that depends though on the particular, very particular scenarios of Estonia and Taiwan, right? Um, if you have a one war sort of scenario with a great power, though, there could be other scenarios where you actually, because when, when I listened to your talk, it sounded like, yeah, we're going to war with China and not just a little skirmish in right. you know, the South China Sea. So are there any plans on that, on how this will play out? Or is it just like, as long as you don't come to US territory or don't send us a nuke, we're, we're going to be fine? I mean, I, I can't speak to the actual plans because I, you know, I have, don't right. know what's in them. And if, if I did, I couldn't talk about it anyways. Right. But I, you know, I, there are certainly, um, you know, Dar Daryl Press and Kira Lieber have written an article arguing that the United States could use low yield nuclear weapons to wipe out the North Korean arsenal uh, in the event of a war on the Korean peninsula. I mean, my, my understanding is that even, even that now would be a riskier proposition than it was in 2017, because the North Koreans have used the last two years to basically build a system of underground tunnels where they can move around their nuclear weapons in a more secure fashion. And so I'm sure there are scenarios in which nuclear weapons figure into American planning, but, but when push comes to shove, if you're talking about a conflict over important, but uh, you know, ultimately limited geopolitical stakes, while I can see the military logic in some cases of nuclear escalation, I, I cannot see the political logic or the political feasibility of it. And so I, I don't think it would happen. Chris, Chris Jelpe. Thanks. You're still muted. Hey, thanks very much. Yeah, there we go. Um, uh, thanks, I really enjoyed the, the presentation. I've enjoyed the, the discussion um, so far. Uh, I, my question is about um, what the, how this sort of literature, and so this isn't just a question to your paper, Hal, but um, it strikes me that, that, that your paper and that a lot of this literature tries to make judgments about should we have a one war or one and a half war or whatever strategy with, with and then tries to make judgments about how many, how, what kind of military resources we would, uh, we would need without actually making any judgments or assumptions about what the goals of those war would would be. So people talk about, well, you know, we have a major power war or a minor power war, but, um, and, you know, John Mueller was saying, oh, we've been so unsuccessful, you know, since World War II. Well, if you look at something like Iraq or Afghanistan, if the goal was to, uh, you know, uh, move, uh, move troops off of territory or topple governments, we're super successful. If the goal is to uh, establish, uh, you know, a whole territory and establish uh, a new government, pretty unsuccessful. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of discussion of like, 
what are we trying to do in these wars? Um, and so am I just missing something there or should that be part of the analysis or what? Yeah, sorry. So I, it's, it's assumed in the paper, um, but, but should have been spelled out explicitly perhaps that the goal in any of these conflicts would essentially be to restore the, the status quo ante. That, that it, it would be to you know, re repulse Chinese, preserve Taiwan as a you know, semi-sovereign political entity to uh, preserve or restore the territorial integrity of the Baltic states to give an example, but, but presumably not to go any, any further than, than that, right? So I don't, I don't think it would you know, turn into, I don't think in either case it would turn into sort of a regime change operation if only because you don't do regime change against nuclear armed powers, uh, and it, you know for a variety of other reasons as well. So the, I think these would be kind of um, uh, Gulf War ninety one type uh, objectives, right? Re reverse the aggression, stymie the aggression if you can, and preserve the the status quo as close to what it was beforehand. I, I'm sure that U.S. officials, if they were confident they would win a war over Taiwan would also love the have, to have the opportunity of sinking a bunch of Chinese ships and submarines and, and things like that in a way that would make the military balance more, more favorable. But I think that would be more of a byproduct of the war rather than the, the avowed political objective of it. Does that, does that answer the question, Chris? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it, um, it, it strike, I mean, that, so that makes sense. I would argue if, if you look at how we've actually used force most of the time in the last 30 years or so, that hasn't really been what it's been for. Ab um, abso absolutely. Right. So, so that would be a pretty big, so that seems to me like a noteworthy change, not just of how many wars do we want to fight or what kinds of adversaries are we thinking about, but what kinds of goals are we thinking that we can actually achieve with our military? Um, uh, because I mean, what you what you said makes sense to me, but I, but I don't think it's what we've been doing for the last thirty years. I, I no, I I would agree with that, which I think is one of the reasons why this represents such a pretty stark change. I don't Thanks. have any questions. Uh, does anyone? Uh, I've had a couple people say they can't raise their hand. Um, they're they're not able to have that functionality. But I, I'm I'm assuming that everyone does have that except Chris. Yeah. Apparently it's a, it's a host or co-host thing. So oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hosts and co-hosts apparently, according to Google, cannot, um, right. uh, cannot do that. So, yeah. So it, are we really uh, not have, okay, I'm going to just go with that. And so let's take a five minute break. Five hey, minute Randy, before, before we break, could I, I just like to thank everybody for the comments and the discussion. Oh, yeah, thank, yeah, yeah. thank you for putting together such a, a, li a lively event. Yeah, and I'm sorry if you think, I, trust me, Hal, I have great respect for you. I'm not, I was- Oh, Jewish likewise. Here. It's a very New York Jewish thing. Like, you know, we, we yell and scream. We don't mean anything by it. I have a twin brother. So we yelled and screamed constantly at each other. And that's just how I interacted <laughs> from the womb. Very hard I to change. Can only imagine. So, so that's just the way I am. But I'm. It had nothing personal to do with you. I was just throwing it out there. Likewise, I, I I enjoy the debate. Great. Thanks, Hal. Thanks, Andy.